You probably can't tell from looking at me, but this is my first time in a boxing ring. And uh, that introduction is not the one that usually precedes a discussion about ethics. But what I'd like to do is actually bring together some of the ideas from our previous speakers, because in Jim's conversation, in his presentation about talking about relationships with customers and the relationships inside an organization, in the previous presentation that we had from Angus talking about some of the dynamics affecting our customers, what ethics really provide us are tools for understanding and responding to those customers for those, and to those employees on those basic dimensions of their humanity. Now, why is this important? Why, sh why does it deserve to be the closing presentation of a conference like this where you've spent a lot of time really honing your intelligence about customers? Um, I'll start with a, with a quick article that I read in Business Week about three, year, uh, three weeks ago. The president of Ford, Alex Trotman, was being interviewed, and he was giving a, a, a profits warning to analysts saying that there was a heavy degree of rebating required to move product through the system this year, and that likely rebates would continue into the future. Now, all of us that have been involved in business for a while know that rebates were around in the business years ago and that the auto sector became addicted to it. The interviewer said, what's the problem? In the past, you needed rebates to sell a poor quality product. You needed rebates to bribe consumers because the product wasn't as good as the Japanese counterparts. What's the problem today? Trotman said, it's not quality, it's not any of this stuff. We live in the age of the lean and mean customer. And I thought about that, and it struck me that we have now gone full circle. Ten years of re-engineering, ten years of lean and mean company practices have created pressure on governments to become lean and mean, which as a result have created a society that is now lean and mean, and an individual consumer that, as we saw from Angus's charts about disposable income and declining wages, is unable to actually go out and buy a new Ford product at full retail price. So we've created a society that now mimics corporate culture. And all of us are suffering the consequences of that. Simple things like road rage, to me, isn't about what happens on roads. It's about the ethos at the workplace that's very angry, that's very pressure filled, that's very ungenerous. And the only people, the only place people have any control over their lives is when they get on the 401 with their four wheel drive vehicle, and that's where they can be raging right back. They can't do it to their boss, but they can take it out to people on the street. We're seeing it in schools with, with more and more violence. We're seeing it on our streets. The ethos of lean and mean has become the defining ethos now that our consumers are bringing into our environments. And they're saying they don't have time for us. They don't have patience for us. They're often angry when they walk into a store. The, the cab driver who took me down here today talked about how many times people get angry at him and it's got nothing to do with anything he did. They just walked into his cab angry. All of you that are in retail probably experienced the same thing. So my presentation today, which deals with the topic of are your profits good enough, is meant, of course, to probe that question from both perspectives. The reason I think it's appropriate to be in a boxing ring talking about competitiveness and being really lean for the future is that ethics are part of how we become better business people today. It's part of how we break that cycle of meanness that customers are now bringing to us and introduce a motivation, a reciprocity with them whereby we can begin to engage each other more in that respectful brand loyalty, customer loyalty uh, type experience that we grew up with and that we're all longing to create. Ethics have often been held as being counterproductive to business. And often, uh, business is seen as rational and ethics are seen as emotional. But in doing the work of preparing this book, I was able to uncover a lot of rational information, a lot of facts that should cause all of us to take a step back and reevaluate whether these two things are actually operating in antipathy. The first statistic that I've got up here is that corruption, fraud, bribery, uh, white collar crime, in quotes, costs the American economy a hundred billion dollars a year. Think about that staggering amount. Now Canadians, we have this perception of being slightly nicer than our American counterparts. Numbers are horrendously difficult to compare, but the RCMP actually estimates that the numbers for Canada are 20% higher on a per capita basis. The costs to Canada of white collar crime, bribery, corruption are about 12 billion dollars per year. 
Uh, there are regulatory reasons for that. Things like BREEX could probably never have happened in the United States because the Security Exchange Commission is more empowered and also because the laws governing white collar crime are criminal offenses. You go to jail. One of the things that the RCMP has noted is that in the last five years because the Americans have clamped down on fraudulent behavior, a lot of boiler, boiler room operators have actually moved their operations north of the border and operate out of Canada. And if they get closed down, they get a slap on the wrist, and they reopen the next day. So we think as Canadians that perhaps we're immune from some of this global pressure. But in fact, think of what a $12 billion drain is to our economy. I did some quick numbers. It's the equivalent to the profitability of the top 50 corporations in this country. So that's the loss. Think of all the economic activity that gets generated to create the counterweighting profit on a year-by-year -year basis. Fortune 500 companies, again because of the greater regu uh, sc regulator scrutiny in the United States, uh, have been shown over a 10-year period between 1985 and 1995, 80% 80 of Fortune 500 companies got caught in a major corruption or, or scandal or some type of, uh, of law-breaking exercise. And these are companies that have all sorts of legal counsel and that have all sorts of ethics codes in place. But my point is that it's commonplace. How commonplace? The statistics out of the U.S. show that about 35% of all workers in all workplaces, average workers doing their job, will witness an unethical or an illegal activity that they presume violates the, the ethics code of their own organization in the course of a year. And this number has been increasing because been, there's been more and more pressure on the bottom line. People take more and more opportunities to cut corners. They feel that that's actually what management wants them to do. Even if we have a code over here, they obviously want me to make this sale or to earn this customer, and I'll do whatever it takes to get there. So we're dealing with a problem that's not on the periphery of the economy, but that is actually mainstream, and that actually has some significant costs to us. Realizing that I was speaking to business people, I spent a lot of time working the whole notion of ethics through the prism of a balance sheet. And I can go through these fairly quickly, uh, but they're important to touch on. On the Liability side, not attending to ethics, often costs organizations a lot of money. You saw that number for $12 billion. This week I was interviewed by a U.S. Uh, magazine about a Mitsubishi settlement that's, that finally settled a class action suit uh, brought against Mitsubishi by female workers over sexual harassment. $33 million was this settlement. They previously settled two years ago for another $26 million. We're talking about $50, $60 million already. Plus, all the reputation damage that's, that's been incurred against the brand. And go on and on. Think about Texaco last year, where a class action suit by black employees over racist policies of the organization. Think about Nike, which has actually seen its business slow down. On and on and on. Think about the resistance we Canadians have to the banks proceeding with these proposed mergers. A lot of that resistance, even though it, it makes business sense for them to go forward as larger organizations in this global economy, we're holding back, vesting our support in those banks um, because we don't trust them. We basically don't have a relationship where we think that they've been fair to us in the past and why should we in fact believe them in the future. We heard from Jim the importance of brands. Brands are incredibly powerful. We've also heard from him how they can grow in a very, very short period of time. Out of nowhere, a brand can come to prominence. But the flip side of that is that brands are also much more fragile. Nike, yesterday's powerhouse, all of a sudden is vulnerable for a lot of different reasons, for overexposure, for the hubris of believing that a shoe is bigger than the athletes that wear them, but also for the fact that for five years they haven't listened to their own shareholders and their own customers complain about the way that workers are treated in their subcontractors' sweatshops. So even the paradigm brands like Nike are vulnerable to ethical erosion, and it happens very quickly. This is an issue that I think that any of us that are managers have to attend to. The idea of civil disobedience actually emerged in some research that was done by Environics. And what they found was that workers were beginning to reciprocate back to management and to the companies that employed them um, on the way that they had been treated over the last 10 years. In a, a reverse reciprocity has been at play. And the way that they describe it in the research, it's things like, um, Employees haven't had salary increases for years. Often they have wage rollbacks. Because of re-engineering, they have new responsibilities or often asked to work longer hours. They also see senior executives walking away with large pay packets, 
uh, sometimes behaving in a way that is even disconnected to the actual performance of the organization. And what employees increasingly do is they take it upon themselves to, to uh, balance the unfairness. So it's small stuff. It's not big crime, although some of that happens. It tends to be things like I take a client out for dinner and rather than putting in a $100 expense report, I'm going to put in $200 because I haven't had a raise in so long. Or spending time on the internet. Um, an article in, in this week's Economist about the amount of time workers are spending on the internet playing video games. Well, because they're at the office longer hours, we're all working many more hours than before. This is part of how we get our due paid back to us. So in other words, the uh, companies have been taking advantage of employees. Employees aren't neutral in this exchange. They will eventually find ways of taking advantage back just to balance the scorecard.